All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbeen.com. I hope you are well. Welcome to one more show. Today, as usual, is my favorite day. Today, we're going to have our heart to heart, our one on one, and discuss various questions. Uh, I wanted to start with uh, thanking so many folks who have been uh, supporting and donating for so many months. So, um, the cutest that I thought was uh, the time when somebody from uh, India sent me, I think, 16 or 17 cents. And uh, PayPal deduct deducted all of that as a fee and sent me a message saying, you got $0. But the, the, the feeling of somebody doing whatever they can to support this work was heartwarming. So thanks to them. And I wanted to go over some of the uh, folks who have uh, uh, donated. So Suzanne Spatz, thank you. Dr. Raymond Vijahak, David Clements, March Caesar, Rahul Komineni, Edwin Shiotsuka, Charles Goran, Marlene Thompson, uh, Major Lynch, I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing the names correctly. Uh, Clive Austin, Matthew Drazel, Natasha Hoskins, Sylvia Weingard, Robinson, Margaret McInnes, um, Faina Shaklon, Shaklonson, uh, Gail Cartoon, Margaret McInnes again, Colorway by Vicky Welsh, Dick Roberts, um, Joseph Barbuto, Margaret McGinnis, again, I, I said that Margaret has been a big supporter. So Margaret, thank you very much. Uh, Corinthian Decoratives, James Ackerman, Robinson, Karen Every, Nizreen Boya, Insanely, Google, um, Robert Pace, Best Friend Sitters, Fred Nielsen, Sylvia Weingard, Charles, Charles Groen, April Stevenson, Rahul Komineni, Margaret McInnes once more, Donald Close, Emma Consulting, Megan McRight, Linda McKinney, Frank Dersh, um, Christopher Asuncion, Reynald Ryan, Ronald Ritz, Nathan Chung, Susan Spatz once more, Dennis Garber, Lori Erman, Mark Rice, Darren Sparks, Roy Saiki, Joseph Block, Sophia Smith, Siddhartha Mitra, Russell Dunlop, Robert Peace, Lucy Izzard, Kellen Rutter, Zubin Gai, and, and the list continues. It continues. So please, um, my thanks to everyone. It, it's, I'm still scrolling it, and it is continuing. So if I did not say your name, please thank you very much for your support. Thank you for... Um, enabling us to continue to produce these uh, sessions. I sometimes think that if you like what we are doing, we should, even in general, other than COVID, I think this, this kind of uh, education and information should be available to healthcare professionals as well. So maybe this can evolve into something that we do together to educate healthcare professionals so they are better prepared when they are handling us as patients. So with this, thank you everyone. Welcome here and let's start our discussions. Um, let, let's start. So the questions are uh, on the Twitter. So I'm gonna share my screen. And how is everybody, everyone doing? So thank you very much. The questions here on the uh, live stream side Please, when you uh, write the questions, please write a word question with them so it becomes easy. Otherwise, I'm kind of scrambling and I'm nervous as well that I'm speaking with you. And if I'm taking time to find questions, I'm wasting time as well. So um, let's just do it that way. So let's start. In this uh, discussion, we are starting from here. This is the Twitter. So I'm going to mix Twitter and live. So. <clears throat> Sag Leos says, idea 
Argentine protocol study. So there is a study from Argentine that is called IDEA and where they used uh, certain drugs to treat patients in the um, mild cases, moderate cases, and severe cases, and they have very good outcomes. So I wanted to quickly show it. And thank you, um, Sag Laos, for bringing it up. So here it is. The IDEA stands for ivermectin, dexamethasone, enoxaprin, and aspirin. So enoxaprin and aspirin both are anticoagulants. Dexamethasone is steroid, which is anti-inflammatory and um, immune system modulator, uh, almost suppressor of the immune system. And ivermectin, we have seen, has been a good, good antibiotic as well. Now, what they have said in this specific study, and I have that here opened as well, um, the only thing that they did different was that for ivermectin, they used a dose that was larger than therapeutic dose. So what is a therapeutic dose? Normal therapeutic dose for deworming of ivermectin is 150 to 200 microgram per kilogram body weight. So for example, if a person is 70 kilogram, then 150 multiplied with by 70 is this, and that is allowed about 11.2 milligram per day. And that is usually one dose only. And the ivermectin comes in six milligram tablets. So I usually give two tablets one day. However, the way I prescribe my patients is I give them two tablets, that is six and six milligram, 12 milligram per day for five days. So that is, again, higher than therapeutic dose. Here, what they did was that their dose itself was higher. So uh, let's very quickly look at what was their dose. And you would actually be amazed. Look at this. So they had in mild stage, they were giving 24 milligram on day zero and then seven. So twice, zero and seven, 24 milligram. So if six milligram for a 70 kilogram person is a standard dose, then it is this dose is four times higher. Then in moderate cases, they gave 36 milligram. In severe cases, they gave 48 milligram. So that is the only dose which they had given in higher doses, only drug. Other drugs like dexamethasone and the uh, enoxaprine and, and aspirin were given in regular therapeutic doses. The result was very interesting. The result was that they had, so they had a total of 167 patients. Out of those, one patient died. And so 0.59% was their mortality rate. On the other hand, Argentine's standard mortality rate for COVID-19 has been 2.1%. So they definitely beat that number, although the number of uh, patients are less, 167, but it still is a decent number. So the standard was 2.1%. Their rate, mortality rate was 0.59%. Fewer people actually were um, uh, going to I ICU, or I, I believe none of them ended up in ICU. So this is the IDEA study, and this is their IDEA protocol. So um, beautiful uh, protocol, beautiful study. Thank you very much for showing it, and I love it. So once again, I, I have seen that ivermectin is more safe and, uh, and works even faster than hydroxychloroquine. So somebody was asking me on Twitter, which drug would you choose? I have been giving my patients nowadays ivermectin in the beginning, and then if needed hydroxy or some to some patients, hydroxy and ivermectin. So Saglaios, thank you very much for this question. Uh, next, <clears throat> a new white paper on success of hydroxychloroquine and the burden of proof. So this is a good white paper. I actually saw that, downloaded it, read it, and I feel that this statement here, the conclusion by this white paper is very, very interesting. What they are saying over here is by systematically misrepresenting hydroxychloroquine efficacy and safety for political ends, its opponents have de de deprived many tens of thousands of Americans of a potentially life-saving treatment and risk even more in the months and years to come. So I agree with this. I agree with the whole paragraph as well. I continue to think about this um, hydroxychloroquine issue. So <laughs> on one end, it is political. We know this, that it has become political. We also know that there are commercial interests that are against it. 
The other thing that I think a technical problem has been that the studies that were done with higher doses were not correct. The studies that were done at the right time, the time was not correct. This hydroxychloroquine should have been looked at in the outpatient. The reason I think that is that whenever I treat my patients, all of my patients have recovered. None of my patients, with the grace, uh, grace of God, I feel hesitant saying it, touch wood, none of my patients have died. So I know that when I use hydroxychloroquine, my patients survive. And the way in my own head, the way I think about is it really working or not is the following. We know that out of 100 people, 19 people will end up in ICUs. That is standard study and standard data. Out of those 19 then, three or four will die as well. So uh, uh, beyond the children's age. So we know that there is three to 4% mortality. I have now managed hundreds of patients, all kinds of ages, and mostly uh, 16 years and above with comorbidities and none of them have died. So if let's say hydroxychloroquine was working as a placebo for us, meaning I was just using it and patient was just taking it and this was nothing but just a comfort, it was doing nothing. If that was the case, then out of hundreds of patients, these, the data should look like the same and that is per 100, there should be three, two or three people dying. But none of them died in my, my uh, management groups or in my treatment. And that was all outpatient treatment. And nobody is looking at my data to say, okay, what did you see? And so are we not looking at Dr. Zelenko's data unless he presents it, which he's doing. So I think that the studies were also incorrect. And this is where I believe more than the people who are doing studies, it is the responsibility of the WHOs and CDCs and FDAs and the National Institute of Health Administrations. Their job was to aggregate the outpatient doctors, maybe choose 100 doctors and say that, all right, you just treat the way you are treating. Give us the data. Tell the patient that we would use their data, at least for statistical purposes, and then see what is happening. Because when I treat it, I know it is working. So now if somebody comes to me and says, all right, <clears throat> give us data the way we present ICU data or we present um, hospitalized patients data, give us that rigorous data. I just do not have resources to produce that data. And then if somebody comes in and says, OK, fine, you have 50 patients that you treated uh, treated hundreds, but I'm just giving a, um, an example. We need a larger study. Then the right way to do that study is to have 100 or 200 outpatient doctors and collect all of their data. That would make thousands of patients and then look at the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine with zinc and azithromycin. So I think there is a technical problem informing the studies as well. And that is a health leadership's problem. They should be doing these thinkings instead of people just trying to convince them and they're just saying, no, we're not going to be convinced. So I think enough said, this is a very decent paper. I would request you to look at it. Um, there is this comment by Chris Master John, it seems mostly that um, Chris wanted to share his own work. But when I went to the site, here it is. This site does not have the article he is mentioning. And mostly this seems like a WordPress's uh, just standard uh, template. So Chris, uh, number one, thank you very much for the comment. Number two, I just could not find this. Maybe there's an issue on my end. Uh, <clears throat> then here. Uh, Relojiro or Relojiro. Hello, doctor. How about talk with COVID-19 crusher? So I did look at COVID-19 crusher's uh, profile. I do not know if they are a doctor. Their profile doesn't say anything. So I've left them a message or, or a tweet with you to see um, who they are. And if uh, possible, we can talk with them. Why not? Uh, K-pop super strong. I want to ask if you've already heard of the movement of some of the doctors flattening the fear encouraging people to go back to work and to um, uh, and no lockdowns and just keep prophylactic meds like hydroxy and vitamin to avoid severe outcomes. What do you think about their advocacy? So um, there are a couple of things in this one. Number one, 
I do not believe in no mask. I do believe that masks help. Now, which kind of a mask will help? There is another question. I will look into that as well. When we are looking at masks that are homemade or fiber that is not really uh, uh, proven fiber, for example, let's say this is my eyeglass fiber. And when I use this, this I cannot breathe through this. So I'm going to breathe through the openings and I'm going to breathe out through the openings as well. So this is kind of useless. Uh, on the other hand, surgical masks, for example, they are made in a way to catch the pathogen. And then somebody was saying me that, hey, if you catch the pathogen, then you're going to re-inhale it and then the mask is going to become bad. Well, this is why we actually dispose of the masks. That masks are not supposed to be reused forever. So masks should be disposable. That is number one. And number two, uh, and I wanted to do a uh, at length discussion of why masks are important because once again, we are muddying up the water in US with the masks once more. Uh, somebody said to me that, well, when you breathe out, the mask would catch all the billions of pathogens. And when you breathe back in that, these number of pathogens are going to go back in and now you have a greater viral load. Look, when we are exhaling, the virus that is coming out is only coming from the surfaces of the of the uh, epithelium of our airway. It is the virus is actually inside the cells. It is in much larger, greater numbers. So if we inhaled back some particles, it's not going to do much. And if we are using the right mask, the right mask has electrical charges on it. The thread has the charges which would trap the virus with it and virus is not going to go back. So this uh, strange new sciences in the viral load would increase and the carbon dioxide would increase and somehow this is bad. That I do not believe in. So I looked at flattening the fear. I agree with the principle of let's go back to work fine. But I do not agree with let's go back to work without masks. Uh, and I would do one more uh, discussion in detail only about masks because this area is becoming now confusing once more. Okay, so uh, oversight. Since poorer COVID-19 outcomes are linked to inflammation, wouldn't living a ketogenic lifestyle possibly reduce the severity of COVID-19? Yes. So carbohydrates are known to cause inflammation. And so when people do ketogenic diets, most of the time their inflammations, their pains, their joint pains, their aches reduce. And one of the contribution fact, contributory factor is that they are taking no carbs and that reduces general propensity of the body to have inflammation. So yes, if somebody is on ketogenic diet, in theory, they are less prone to infection, uh, inflammation. And so they should have a better response to COVID or less or a milder response to COVID. Now, I did not find any study, so I cannot scientifically say with deterministic answer that this is the right, uh, this has happened, but in theory, this is correct. Then uh, Scott Robinson. So after this, I'm going to come to the live stream and look at uh, the questions there. Since hydroxychloroquine is so hard to get, how comparable is quercetin or ivermectin? So very, very good question. And for this one, I have the link in the description as well to Dr. Zelenko's protocol. I'm going to very quickly open that up and show it to you. So here, this is Dr. Zelenko's uh, prophylaxis. And Dr. Zelenko has a tweet pinned on his uh, um, Twitter. And that tweet has the links to these documents. And I have them in this, this description as well. Uh, if you see here, quercetin 500 milligram. OTC once a day. And then if you go to his treatment protocol over there as well, he's talking about quercetin, quercetin 500 milligram two times a day for seven days. So back here to the question that if the hydroxychloroquine is not there, how much quercetin? So 500 milligram. Now, ivermectin, Ivermectin's dose for deworming is 150 microgram to 200 microgram per kilogram body weight once. But I have used it in the same therapeutic dose, but more times than once. And you, as you just saw in the IDEA study, they have used 
four to, I believe, eight times the dose of this dose that I just mentioned, and they gave it twice in one week, day zero and day seven. Okay, so let's look at the live discussion here. And yes, uh, there's somebody is talking about the EGCG or uh, green tea as well. So if you look at Dr. Zelenko's uh, protocol here, he does talk about EGCG as well. And he's saying if quercetin is unavailable, then use epigalactogen galate or EGCG 400 milligram. So he does say that the uh, substance that is in the green tea use that. All right. So back here, I'm going to look through the questions here. Should we always take zinc with quercetin or with EGCG, both with food? Uh, so here's the thing. Zinc can compete with other minerals that we take. So sometimes if you separate it out from food, it may find empty epithelial surfaces or gut epithelium to absorb better. So if you can kind of uh, separate it out from the food, it is actually better. So this was the question here uh, from Barbara. Then there's a question from M. Gregory. Just found this article titled, Should I Stock Up on Seaweed? In cell studies, seaweed extract outperforms remdesivir in blocking COVID-19. I will have to read this one to see how seaweed works. Although in my home, seaweed is used a lot. Uh, my children and uh, my wife, they like to have uh, shrimps and other seafood soups, and they use seaweed in it. I'll have to look in. Uh, M. Gregory, can you send me the link? Maybe tweet me the link. <laughs> so Lorraine, uh, Lorraine Hernandez, Chief Bean, I need an answer. What's the meaning of life? So I could have taken this as a joke as well, because who am I to tell what's the meaning of life? But I'll tell you what is the meaning of my life. Um, and I learned it over time my phases of my own life in the beginning i wanted to tell people what i'm thinking so when i used to be a teenager or early in my 20s my basic need used to be to just tell people what i'm thinking what i think is right and put in my voice then um i i thought that earning money was the important meaning of life and so doing things and growing in career and, and um, earning more money. And then I found out that the most comfort, so I earned money, definitely. I was able to provide my opinions to others as well. I'm doing it right now too. But finally, I found out that the most comforting, most peaceful, and the most loving way of having a meaningful life which may not be meaning of life, but having a meaningful life was to serve others. And when we are serving others, there are two kinds of services you would see. There are those whose behavior will show that they are serving with an agenda and they want something in return. And then you would see some folks who would serve honestly and uh, with purity and then they would be given all the rewards that they want. But the service has to be with that um, honesty. So this is where I have reached so far. Maybe as I progress further uh, in life, I would understand more. But this is how much I've known so far, that the meaning of life is to actually engage and serve the people around, the humanity, and then let the universe respond back to you in the right way. Um, so SNC Nutrition says, is green tea better than quercetin as a zinc ionophore? And do you have taken them at the same time? So uh, once again, as you just saw, 400 milligram of EGCG or uh, 500 milligram of uh, um, quercetin are both uh, possible and equivalent. I think none; they are not better one or the other because quercetin is present in so many of our foods. Uh, onions and the red skin 
products and many of the vegetables have quercetin and we eat them and this is very useful similarly green tea is actually a big culture green tea is a very important thing my wife is a tea taker so she has all kinds of teas and tea cups and everything so tea is a big deal and i am not a tea guy i am a more of a coffee person but uh, i think they are equivalent there is a question <clears throat> i believe your reference would need to be revalidated regarding the percentage that get hospitalized and the 0% that die we are seeing much lower percentage even in countries not using hydroxy um i do not know if this is directed at the idea if i go to idea for a second idea study they have their data here or are you talking about me saying that out of 100 people 19 become severe and then 3 or 2 or 3 die if that is the case it is very very different in various geographies so, so generally this is how it is uh, even for this argentine uh, study if you see here they are saying that their standard mortality rate is 2.1% but that is um, overall correct so at least for my patients again i say that i don't want to jinx it i touch wood and uh, i thank the lucky stars for myself and my patients i have no no one who died and i have in hundreds that i have treated so um, there is a there is a uh, benefit of hydroxychloroquine the, the, my treatment protocol is all of these vitamins that i talk about with uh, hydroxychloroquine and zinc or ivermectin so continuing on arun says australian studies show that cu containing silk mask is the best is it okay so uh, arun i have to see the study the basic thing with the mask is this if i just take up any piece of cloth and use it as a mask it may not be able to actually contain the virus it may be so thick that it may not allow the virus to exit or get trapped in it it might actually just exit through the holes and so um, it may be just useless on the other hand the right masks that are used in hospitals for example surgical and n95 they have traps in the mask itself that can trap the pathogen and then of course that mask will become contaminated and we have to throw it away we cannot continue to reuse it unless the pathogen is killed by so on surgical mask covid-19 uh, sars cov 2 dies in 2 to 3 days so that means they need to be put away for 2 to 3 days and then reused i would prefer them to just be thrown away um so marie says would you accept a job to work in a call center where everyone wore masks and work workstations were spaced at least 6 feet apart temperature checks but no outside ventilation marie this seems to be a very specific um, thing but if i was the one if people are wearing masks 6 feet apart is fine temperature checks are fine my only problem is the aerosol that would develop in the environment so if the ventilation is with the proper hvac and the hvac is able to filter out the viruses then it seems to be okay i would rather sit at home and do it or maybe out in the in an open space compared to a closed space where aerosol may be present but still there seems to be there are protocols that are in place i the aerosol part is something that i'm not clear about what are their uh, protocols to clean the place and ventilate the place that is what should also be seen uh, there is another question here from france i asked dr bean to cover it because it's interesting but hard to tell it could boost both in it and Okay, so I'm sorry I did not catch this one. All right, I'm gonna go to the end once more and see. Cool. So there is one more question. Question: If a person goes around people in an indoor space, then could the coronavirus land on his clothes here? If so, then should a person remove his clothing upon arriving home and was wash his her hair? So that was the original protocol that when you come back home. Uh, change your clothes and and take a shower before you start integrating with the family and at home so uh, yes 
So now I'm going to go back to the Twitter side. So could you, so this is the other interesting question here by Corey Gunnels. Could you please discuss COVID rashes that might be causing it inflammation? What might be causing it inflammation, cytokine break. So let's talk about that. We have not actually talked about COVID rashes. And I think this is an important topic to look at. So let's look at it. This is a study here. This study is cutaneous, cutaneous, that is skin, cutaneous manifestations of COVID-19, report of three cases and a review of literature. So here, number one, they have shown various skin problems that they have seen. For example, this one and this and this. And there, of course, there are more. And then they have discussed what are the possible pathophysiologies over here. So I'm going to very quickly uh, discuss the same here in a visual way. <clears throat> and that is this. Look, so here is our skin. Our skin is made up of multiple layers of cells. The basal layer or the very bottom layer of this multi-layer skin is the one that makes new cells. When those new cells are made, they go towards more superficial layers and eventually they die and just become a, a cornified layer or a protective layer. So what happens is in case of COVID-19, they actually, we do not know exactly what really is the pathology, but there are possible uh, mechanisms that may be involved. One mechanism. So first let's think about it. When there is a rash on the skin or when there are those particular hemorrhages or small dots that we just saw or small raised blood spots, that simply means that there is either inflammation under the skin or there is blood vessel that has become swollen and the blood is oozing, oozing out of it. <coughs> Excuse me. So the question is, how does that happen? So what they thought is that, number one, when the blood vessels that are bringing blood to skin, if there is COVID-19 in those blood vessels, COVID-19, I'm saying SARS-CoV-2, that SARS-CoV-2 can actually cause inflammation of the blood vessel. And how does it do that? Look, what happens is, let's say this is the SARS-CoV-2. And there are antigens, antibodies that our body is producing against SARS-CoV-2. These antibodies are going to be coating the virus. They are going to be stuck to the virus. They are binding or neutralizing, and they're stuck to the virus. This is called antigen antibody complex. That antigen antibody complex can actually get stuck on the vessel surface inside of the vessel. It can get stuck there, which causes local activation of complement system that we've talked before, which in turn causes damage to the blood vessel wall. That causes blood vessel to kind of dilate. That causes local oozing of the fluids and the uh, transudates and even exudate. Exudate means proteins and other things come, can come out. Even blood can start spilling out. So this would create those tiny blotches and this, the uh, pieces, uh, those small pieces of blood or islands of blood. So that is one possibility. That is antigen antibody complex damaging the blood vessel, causing blood vessel to dilate. Another possibility is the same complex is getting stuck in the lymphatics. Lymphatics are large channels, just like we have drains in the cities, which are very large, big pipes or even multi-story pipes which allow the drainage of big material to be taken out. Similarly, our body has lymphatic channels. Lymphatic channels are big, large blood vessels, not blood vessels, vessels through which bigger chunks of fluid can go back and they can go to lymph nodes. And then finally, they arrive back in the blood system. These lymphatic vessels can also become infected by the uh, COVID-19 or they can become damaged the same way with the antibody and antigen complexes. That would also cause them to become inflamed, and that would also cause blood to ooze out and the fluids to get accumulated there. So these are two possibilities. A third possibility is that in the skin, in the skin, we have immune cells like macrophages. We call them Langerhans cells. These are innate immune cells. And these are the cells that are responsible for poison oak or poison IV kind uh, reactions. So what happens is they think that the COVID-19 comes. So the blue ones here are these 
Langerhans cells. So they think that COVID-19 virus comes and these Langerhans cells react to that. They, they are macrophages. So they become active and the local innate arm of the immune system responds. That in turn causes the local keratinocytes, which are the skin cells, to become damaged and inflamed. And that causes the local skin manifestations. A fourth theory, or whatever number of the theory is, that local inflammation then causes complement system activation that we've talked about in the past as well. The complement system activation in turn causes local inflammation, which would cause the cutaneous manifestations. And a fifth theory is that maybe it has nothing to do with the skin. It is actually the thrombi that are being produced in the blood vessels. They come in and they get stuck in the blood vessels under the skin because these blood vessels are very small. And when these thrombi get stuck in the blood vessel, that causes the blood supply to become occluded to the area after, which causes skin damage, which would then cause local bleeding and local skin manifestations. So these are some of the possibilities because of which we can see cutaneous manifestations and rashes and petechiae because of uh, COVID-19. Very good question. So back here, so there are two re related comments here. Sir, here in India, many, so this is Budh, Budhi GV. Uh, sir, here in India, many young doctors without any comorbidities are dying quite regularly or often. Could this be due to high vir viral load and lower innate immune response? Apart from vitamin D11 in blood, are there any other markers that can be used to determine the immunity status? Can this immunity status be included in the list of comorbidities in the national guidelines? So the answer to the second part of the question is yes. The first part of the question is, in my last two or three discussions, especially the discussion with children, we talked about the cells that produce interleukin 17A and interferon gamma. And the lecture before that, we saw that there were T cells that are dysregulated in severe patients. And the authors or researchers had said that at the point of care, we should be able to see the T helper cells that have a specific marker on, the, on them, which tells the propensity of a patient towards becoming severe. So please uh, watch that video. It's about three or four days before today in which I've talked about those T helper cells. So to sh the short answer is yes, in addition to the uh, vitamin D levels, we have to look at a person's uh, T cell markers that would tell us what kind of propensity they have for the immune response. And then based on that, we can say they should be protected more or protected less and so on. And this is a very good idea that this should then be a comorbidity towards severity of the situation? Very, very, very good uh, question. So before I continue there, I'm going to now come back here uh, towards the live stream and see. So Corey Gunnell says, and thank you very much for your response to my question. You're very, very welcome. Uh, I forgot to ask why the rashes would appear when I lie down. So that is just the dynamic changes in the blood flow. And so the uh, if you must have, if not must, if you ever had skin rashes for other reasons, you would, you would see that number one, blood flow, wherever it is increased, that is where the rash manifests more, number one. And number two, wherever the temperature changes, because the Langerhan cells or the mast cells, they love to degranulate very uh, easily. If based on temperature, or sometimes if you take a shower and the, the water drops when they hit our skin, that causes the mast cells under the skin to become angry and say, I don't like things hitting me and they de degranulate. So uh, it is possible that when you lie down, that is when the blood flow changes in various skin parts, number one, and number two, temperature changes, and that temperature change can manifest in inflammation to appear. So good question. Um, Madhu. Sudhan Rao. A study said that asymptomatic patients have high viral load. That means they have high viral debris after replication period. Is it cause of the silent hypoxia? I do not know if uh, this is a confirmed thing that asymptomatic patients have to have a high viral load. 
So um, silent hypoxia is a different reason. So we talked about the silent hypoxia in the last open forum as well. The viral infections of the lung normally cause walking pneumonia, which means that interstitium of the lung becomes affected before or becomes infected before the uh, airway surfaces. And when the interstitium is inf uh, infected, patient may not have cough that much. They may not have, so uh, if William Days is here, cough. So I'm trying to learn the pronunciations. So patient may not have cough that much, but, uh, and they may not have sputum that much because the airway is still intact. But the outside of the airway, when the interstitium is not working correctly, the respiratory membrane is not working correctly, that causes the uh, problem with the uh, oxygenation and hypoxia occurs. We call it walking pneumonia, and that is what happens. But I'm not sure about the viral load in asymptomatic. Please send me the link so I can look at it. Um, So Mary says that our governor has opened up the bars and restaurants 100% without any mass mandate. So that is an interesting one. Mary, how, uh, how have there been any documented case of someone getting infected with the coronavirus from a fomite? Of course, fomite, uh, look, for anyone who catches coronavirus, we can't really tell, did it come from a surface or did it come from the air? We don't know. So documented case itself that this person had it because they touched a surface may not be there. But these are known places where the virus can stay and be there. And if you touch it, it can then infect. So there is a question. Jenny says, since it, it is crossing the blood-brain barrier, can it hide from the immune system there? I am not sure about the question here. Um, <laughs> Ron says, this is a good question. So Ron says, where are your patients getting their HCQ? So Ron, I actually practice remotely in other countries. And in these countries, they can get hydroxychloroquine. Lucky for them. Um, so then there is a question from G. Gupta. Can we start steroids early days, say from day one or two in COVID-19, especially when virus is alive and replicated face and we are also taking antiviral drugs? There is no so much confusion. confusion. Look. <clears throat> This is a very good question. So I'll give you various doctors' opinions, and I'll give you my opinion as well, and I'll give you WHO's opinion too, and I'll give you my uh, under my opinion of what I would do. Dr. Pa Paul Marek says that in the early days, the virus is replicating. Do not suppress the immune system because if there is no immune system or less immune system to fight the virus, then it the virus would just replicate more happily and without hindrance. So don't do it, according to Dr. Paul Marek. When the time comes that the virus replication is now a secondary aspect and the immune system dysregulation is the primary aspect, then using steroid is a must. WHO says the same thing. They don't talk about giving a steroid is a must, but they do say that do not use steroids because the viral clearance uh, reduces uh, because of the use of steroid and suppressing the fighting system of our body, that is immune system. Dr. Richard Bartlett has been using um, the uh, bedazonide, which is inhaled uh, uh, steroids. But if you uh, listen to his uh, answers in my interview, he kind of, when I said that, do you use it in the early stages? He didn't say, I use it in the early stages. He said, my colleagues have re reported that they used it in early stages. So he himself said, I use it slightly later. My own uh, now observation and my own work so far, I have never used uh, steroids in the early phase with the fear 
because of this fear that it can cause exacerbation of virus replication. So I have not dared to do it. Uh, there is one case in which a colleague of mine was uh, managing. He had me as a consultant. And he said that I have a patient I'm going to start them with on steroids right away. And I became a little scared. And I said, don't start them on steroids right away. They, that might cause an issue. And he said, I have been giving steroids from day one. And so I said, fine, then it is your practice. This is my observation. I provided him my opinion. He still started them on the day one. And day second or third patient was actually feeling much better. So there are doctors who use it early on. I am still afraid of giving steroids in the early stages. OK. James says, I'm wondering, are there threshold levels for CRP, ferritin, and D-dimers to start with corticosteroids? So actually, and James, where the patient's oxygen level starts dropping, they should be on steroids. That's one. Second, and the dropping, the definition of that, I use anywhere when it comes to 95, 94, I start steroids. Um, but 94 has been usually used as a cutoff point. I kind of take a chance before that. I don't want to come to that boundary. And then um, in terms of CRP, ferritin, and D-dimers, the doctors have been using them that if these are beyond the normal, normal ranges, they tend to start it. And what I've seen is that the when, the, when it becomes abnormal, these levels, they become abnormal so fast and so rapidly that it only takes two, three days for them to shoot up, you know, um, out of the chart. So it just has to be a very rapid decision. So as soon as the D-dimers, ferritin, uh, C-reactive proteins and so on, you see them going up, you immediately start steroids. You are welcome. Uh, absolutely, Barbara. Timing is the most important part. All right, so I'm going to go back to the Twitter for a second now. So I, if possible, possible, I would like to. So one word, Artemisia, uh, curcumin, I have to talk about them. I just didn't get a chance, so I will. That was Relo Hero's question. Dr. Dharmindra Singh, we must worry about reinfection or can be ignored as numbers are very less. I do not worry about reinfection. I actually think that if somebody, so look, patients are of multiple types. There are patients who are immunosuppressed. There are patients who, whose immune system is dysregulated. There are patients who are taking drugs that cause the immune system not to work correctly or, or is suppressed. So healthy individuals that have responded correctly and have their bodies, either cytotoxic T cells or innate arm or antibody arm, taken care of the infection, they have developed uh, memory cells, and the reinfection is less of an issue. So I would not worry too much. COVID US org, please explain COVID-19 long haulers diagnosis and treatment initiative developed by Dr. Patterson. Dr. Yeo tweeted, if you are, if you or anyone you know are COVID-19 long haulers, Bruce P13 has developed a protocol to examine your immune profile and cytokine levels. ETA late, late September. I would love to see that. So they are doing a good job here because long haulers is an important issue. And uh, this work that uh, Dr. Yeo and Dr. Patterson are doing, Bruce Patterson, that is a good one. And in that, I wanted to share one of the long hauler uh, case with you that I have been talking about it. This is the same person who is about 62 years of age, has cancer as a comorbidities, a few days before he got COVID-19, he had surgery of his shoulder. Then uh, after the surgery, he developed COVID-19. Maybe he got it from the hospital, but he had the COVID-19. In the COVID-19 stage, he became so severe that the oxygen level dropped down to, uh, I heard 86. His daughter says that, sir, I actually saw it at one point down to 84 as well. 
This is the same patient I've been discussing before as well. They took him to the hospital. The hospital didn't have beds. They brought them back. They thought he's not going to survive. They called me and I started the management with hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin together with some other supplements and other things. Within, within one day, he started recovering. Thank God. Then he became a long hauler. So he has recovered. It's about two and a half months now. But he is he was still a long hauler. And what I saw was this. So I gave him a pulse of steroids that I usually talk about for long haulers. And his daughter had long, uh, long haul symptoms. She recovered, but he did not. So last week or a couple of weeks ago, I gave him one more pulse of long uh, steroids. This time he became OK. Now, the only thing that is left is the shoulder pain where the surgery was done is not going. So that area has now become continuously inflamed. So this tells me that there is a immune system dysregulation that areas of the body that were already inflamed, they just continue to be sustained as inflamed. So he had three primary symptoms as long hauler, one fatigue. Second, his, his uh, gums had become swollen and painful, and he could not chew. And the third was the area of the shoulder where he had the surgery. And now the surgery had healed, but he continued to have pain over there. So we started him on uh, physiotherapy as well. We started getting his tests as well, x-rays too. However, after the second pulse, his gums have become recovered. This pain in the shoulder is still there. And so I'm going to start him on uh, Omega, and I'm going to get some tests done. So once again, steroids can actually work very well for long hauling. So I, I'll be very much interested in uh, seeing Dr. Patterson's. Uh, <clears throat> then here is a Tony Karalikas. This mostly seems to me, Tony, that this is uh, you. You would uh, like us to watch your video. I. I have not yet watched it, but your message here that is it possible that uh, thiamine deficiency may be causing a beriberi-like symptom in long haulers, it is possible. So that can only be said deterministically by doing the test. But if we think aloud for a second, somebody who has pain, somebody who has fatigue, somebody who has um, that the issues still going on, they definitely have an inflammatory system or immune system dysregulation. Eventually, all symptoms of pain and those things are coming from immune system dysregulation, unless there is a nerve compression or such other things. So if there is an immune system dysregulation, there has to be a reason for that as well. Is that the reason because the supplements are low or thiamine is low or vitamin D is low or vitamin C is not correct or some other antioxidants are needed or, or maybe we need iron or we need CoQ10? Or is it because the macrophage activation syndrome has occurred and the patient is just continuously in that state and the immune system is just amplifying itself? We don't know yet. And that is why I would love to see Dr. Patterson and Dr. Yo's work to see what are they finding, what is the profile of the patients. But thiamine could be one of the reasons. Uh, three ply mask says an interesting study from Japan. So three ply mask, I have taken the study. I would do a lecture or a talk for the study. Thank you for sharing. Uh, this is uh, I love this one. Rob from Florida. So Rob, Florida, USA. Using the Dr. Bean treatment protocol, zinc, quercetin, vitamin D, C, and elderberry gummy and melatonin. I effectively treated my young son who had a sore throat, body pain, and started a fee to feel warm but no fever. 36 hours later, back to normal, COVID or not, treatment works. And he sent this thank you. So of course, we are all very happy, Rob, that your children. I know that you had dis asked me to discuss the children because you're in Florida and your children are going to go back to school. And you had then decided to send them back to school. So very happy to know that your child is safe and comfortable. And hopefully, you all in the family around the child are also fine and then i saw information purposes and you are well too and then he sent some tibetan music for better sleep so very good uh 
This question, and then I'll come back to the live one. Steven says, question, is it best to take zinc and quercetin as a one-time dose per day or take small doses? Very good question. So I had to look up the half-life of these two things. So here is the general idea. If, let's say, if I'm taking a drug whose half-life is short, let's say I take, take it now, and within one hour it is eliminated from my body, then I have to continue to take it to have therapeutic levels available throughout the day. On the other hand, zinc and quercetin, I looked up their half-lives. And if you see here, this is zinc. Zinc's half-life is 46.5 hours. So if you see here, 46.5 hours. So that means if you take zinc once a day, that is fine. And similarly, quercetin has the half-life of 11 to 28 hours. So that means you can take quercetin once a day as well. Good question. I'm going to go to the live questions here. So, so there's a question Do you think it's better to take flu vaccine and does this affect IQ levels. Flu vaccine should be taken, and no, it should not affect I IQ levels. Uh, France Lorraine says, we have to create our own bubbles like Dr. Bean Group to study, discuss, and be open to solutions and our own health, our loved ones, and spread the word. Absolutely. Maybe we can create a um, Facebook group. Um, I'm just going to see if there are more questions. Arun says, million dollar question. Will I get the million dollar or is it just a question? Winter will worsen this, this situation in India. Reason, low ventilation, crowded rooms. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> winter can cause issues. And so we have to be upfront. I did a video, Arun, about... Uh, winter is coming and what to expect and what to how to get prepared. So there is a um, question. I cannot pronounce your name. I think it is something like Elon Musk's name for his uh, child as well. So since we know how mast cell degranulation contributes to cytokine storm, why not recommend antihistamines? I know some doctors who are doing this. Antihistamine is fine. The problem is not the mast cell in case of the cytokine storm with uh, COVID-19. The problem is macrophage activation syndrome. And that has nothing to do with the mast cells. So mast cell may become activated in those patients who may have skin uh, manifestations and these manifestations may or may not be the mast cells. So antihistamine generally giving may be okay, but the cytokine storm is not because of the mast cells. It's not an allergy. It is an inflammatory disease. <laughs> so uh, M. St. Clair, you're saying everything just fine. We like your speech and intonations and accent. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, all right, so I don't see much questions here on the live side, so I'm going to go on um, the other side. So Debbie Boss says, his shoulder probably was trying to heal, and the inflammatory episode irritated the area and reversed any healing ability as it was a weak area. This happened in my one leg, and we used stem cell therapy to promote healing, and it worked very well. That's what they are going to do as well. So they're going to try PRP. So very good. Um, so then there is a question from Susmario Sepp that have you done a video on cholesterol and statins? Uh, Alan actually responded. So yes, I've done the video on statins. I think that video is here. I have put the link to that video in the, uh, in the description. So I have done a video on, on statins. Uh, continuing on. Ali Al Hadi, this is a good question. It was very interesting for me to think about it. Bradykinins are degraded by ACE enzyme. 
So we have, I have done this discussion as well. So if you see here, this is the, this is my video. And we talked about the mechanism of bradykinin. So if you see here in this diagram, bradykinin is broken down by ACE enzyme into, into bradykinin byproducts. On the other hand, ACE enzyme is also involved in activating or creating angiotensin 2. Now, the question Ali is saying is that if we block ACE enzyme, that may reduce the conversion of angiotensin 2 production that is here. But at the same time, blocking the ACE would also reduce the conversion of bradykinin into inactive bradykinin, which can then increase the bradykinin storm. So in theory, that is correct. So there is a study showing that ACE enzyme blocking is actually helpful. So I have seen that study and I've talked about it as well, that they saw that people who are using ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, they have less chances of uh, uh, cytokine storm. So it is possible that the bradykinin storm does not happen in everyone as well. And so there are some people who develop that storm. Question is, those people, are they, were they on ACE inhibitors or not? But very good question. I don't really have a good answer to this one until we have some more data. Uh, Alan says, yes, I'm also very interested in mechanism of EGCG. So I will do the mechanism of EGCG separately. At this time, at least as a zinc ionophore, we know it, but I will do is So turmeric, uh, wormwood, EGCG, and one more thing that Art Artemisia will talk about it. MT says, a question or a YouTube idea, should different prophylaxis and treatment be used for T helper one versus T helper two? That's a very, very good thought. I love cool beans that we have become so um, kind of, uh, so here is the adaptive arm, correct? And then we know that it can be T helper two pathway or T helper one pathway. And we have seen that T helper two pathway can actually lead to cytokine storm as well. While we are seeing that T helper pathway many times is asymptomatic. Uh, adaptive arm man management is also asymptomatic. So the question is, is there a different way of prophylaxing patients or people who have this arm stronger, for example, children, or who have propensity to go to this arm, what should they do better? And the ones who are are going to go to this arm. That is a very interesting question. My problem only is that how do we tell a person's genetic inclination of going to one side or the other? First, we have to figure out that um, labs to figure out what is the propensity of us. And then, yes, I think we have to then target how do we modulate these patients. In my opinion, because we know that adaptive arm is usually asymptomatic for children. And the T helper one pathway is also asymptomatic even for adults. It is really this pathway of humoral response that causes the problem. So we should see who are uh, who have a higher propensity of the humoral arm and then see what to do for them. Now, one more thing, which uh, I get a lot of uh, comments when I whenever I say this, the comments usually are that, hey, are you saying that children, for example, only have the adaptive arm working. And uh, sorry, this is the innate arm. Why did I call it adaptive arm? So please uh, ignore this. This is innate arm. Innate arm. And this one is adaptive arm. So I get the question very often that, are you saying that only this arm will work or only this arm will work or this? So the answer is no. What will happen is, let's say children, their 60% maybe, I'm making up numbers, the 60% of the viral load is managed at the innate arm level, and then maybe 10, 15% here, and maybe another 15, 20, 25% here. So all arms are active, but the dominant, dominant arm is different. Then similarly, it is possible in some people, let's say adults, what is happening is that the innate arm takes care of, let's say, 15% of the infection. And then the T helper two pathway or the humoral pathway is taking care of the infection by becoming 60% of the dominant arm. And then the remaining is here with T helper uh, one. 
or the other way that T helper one becomes 60% active or taken care of 60% of the infection. So it is that some part becomes more active than other. Uh, Shiva says, thank you so much, Dr. Mubeen. Your full depth illustration and explanation on subject matter has made us very easy to understand everything. You are very welcome, Shiva. I am happy to do it. Uh, continuing on, Lisa Bowles says, question one, why do we have so many false positives of PCR testing? So Lisa, I have done a, a video on the testing and specificity and sensitivity and the positive predictive value and negative predictive value. It is possible that they can be false positive, but I know where, where you're going with this. You are saying that it is, is it possible that false positive are actually, we understand that it tests the presence of the virus RNA, which means that there must have been presence of the RNA in order to be tested positive. This leads to my question too. So the basis is kind of uh, iffy here. What they've seen is that RT-PCR under a certain threshold level would pick up other RNA as well and kind of call it positive. So it is not necessary that I must have had the virus and it was in the smaller loads. So it is possible that I had the virus, but it is also possible that it just picks up some pieces of RNA and just becomes positive. Second part of the question is, could it be that the people tested false positive have the immunity to the virus or asymptomatic patients, the math model? So answer is yes. And I love this one. And I have been talking about this for some time as well. I think this, there is a math model here. This is the model. And let me just once again put that in front of the cool beans here. We have been talking about this for some time now, and that is herd immunity. And many people has, have tweeted to me or sent me emails or comments that how is it possible that we get the herd immunity at 15 or 20 percent? And the answer is, look, we are only testing people with antibodies. So it is possible that in a community, when 15% of the population has antibody response, 15%, maybe in the same population at the same time, maybe there is another 20% that have cytotoxic CD8 response. And maybe in the same society, there is another bunch of people, let's say half of children that have innate arm response. And then maybe in the same society, there are people who are wearing masks and they are not becoming part of the R0. And maybe there are people who are just keeping social distance or staying at home and, and taking care of all the SOPs. So there are multiple reasons that work together to reduce the R0 to a level of one to stabilize the disease. So here, can we reach herd immunity in the presence of only 15% of antibodies? Yes. Why? Because we have to add these other factors as well overall to this math to say, OK, we are actually, let's say, 60 percent uh, um, immune. So that I love this math model that there is a possibility that that is how it works. So I think uh, being false positive, it may be a role as well or maybe a way to detect. But in general, it is possible that a community has reached a higher level of protection because the people have more protection than just the antibodies. OK, so continuing on, um, Ali says, why does SARS-CoV-2 cause cytokine storm and immune disregulation out of other known viruses? And of course, AVOX is uh, responding and saying that's a good question. So look, this is a beautiful question. And my only theory so far is that this is the first virus we are seeing. So SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV used to not work with ACE enzyme. This is the one that works with ACE2 enzyme that in turn causes the inflammatory systems imbalance that in turn causes it to have the systemic effects that we see, which means it is possible that any virus that uses ACE2 the way this virus is doing would produce similar outcomes. And that is what sometimes scares me that those folks who may want to create um, damaging viruses, weapons, 
they may have seen this virus to say, wow, this works very well for the whole community or the world to kind of put them in trouble. And so ACE2 seems to be the problem here because MERS and the SARS-CoV-1 did not use ACE. So that inflammatory dysregulation and severe dysregulation is probably because of ACE2. Now, there is other possibility that this virus has a better way of uh, spreading. Of course, that is why it is going out in the whole globe that fast. Why did SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV not do it? I am not sure why. Why did that? Were we better at that time um, in containing it? Or were these viruses weak enough and not using the ACE2 type enzymes and not causing enough sever severity and enough spread? Don't know. But the difference from those is the ACE2. So Alan had said, uh, talked about anosmia or loss of smell. And the question basically was that Alan's friend uh, have COVID-19, they have loss of smell. And so now, not only the loss of smell, they have now sort of uh, phantom smells. So in medicine, we use the, the term phantom to say something that does not exist is being felt. For example, soldiers who go out in war, sometimes they have some limbs blown off, but they would still come to their doctor and say, my limb has uh, itch on it or it has pain in it and the lib limb doesn't exist, and that is called phantom limb issue. Similarly, they're talking about phantom uh, smell. So that means they're not just a nose mic, but they have different smells that may not exist. And uh, the question is, number one, why is that? And number two, how long would that sustain? So the study here is for a nosemia, Prevalence and duration of acute loss of smell. So generally, um, it has been observed that the anosmia Allen can stay for two to three weeks. So that is one. And now the question is, why do we have the, the paresthesia? Paresthesia or phantom smell. Paresthesia is abnormal sensation. It's very simple, actually. So if I uh, make some cells here. So let's say this is the olfactory system and so from at the at the top of our roof uh, sorry roof of our nose we have the sensory nerves that are for smell and these sensory nerves are then accompanied by supporting cells sustentacular cells as we call them these cells are present here to support them and to provide nutrition to the nerve that is present the virus actually infects the sustentacular cells not the, the nervous system nerve itself. Now, when the sustentacular cells are infected, they cannot provide nutrition correctly and they cannot support the sensory system here correctly. And that causes anosmia when the inflammation is too much. And then paresthesia or phantom smells, as you said, Alan, is because these cells are not functioning correctly. So sometimes when that causes irritation, on the nerve part, which is looking for oxygen and looking for nutrition and other things and support, when those supports are not right, the nerve would just fire. And the firing of the nerve might create weird smells. So that is what's happening. Um, so Avox says, I'm back with this question. The subject isn't me, but she's my patient. Is it okay to take melatonin if you take losartan? I think yes, but I need to be sure. 30 year old woman, no health issues aside from high blood pressure and occasional hypoglycemia, takes no other meds than NSE, quercetin, zinc, vitamin C, D, and B1. So, um, Avox, I don't see any issue for this age and this healthy level to take uh, melatonin uh, with losartan. So, no issues. The only thing is melatonin may give them scary dreams. So, they continue to reduce the dose where it becomes good enough that they don't see those uh, candid, vivid dreams. And that is it on the um, Twitter side. I'm going to now answer a couple of questions here, and then um, we'll go from uh, here. So let's see. I hope you guys are doing OK. So we are once again one hour and 17 minutes into it. Um,
So there's a question from Dr. Mahesh Patsalj. So can you elaborate elaborate on how can we really know, be able to get the window of time? Oximeter, oximeter, oximeter. As soon as the oxygen levels start dropping, let's say below 97, and just continue to drop, you know we have a problem and we are moving from viral to dysregulated immune system, start steroids. Um, so again, uh, Dr. Mahesh, same thing. Oximeter is the best thing to tell. If you are at the point of care, then you can do CRP and ferritin and D-dimer and C uh, uh, ESR and other such things to see the inflammatory proteins. <coughs> Excuse me. Myron Bunny says, if herd immunity is reached at 20%, then 40% plus are not susceptible. So again, the question is the same. 20% is only the antibody part. What percentage of the community at the same time has become cytotoxic uh, uh, active? And how much percent has become innate active? And how much percent is taking masks or social distancing? All of them collectively are reducing the uh, spread of the virus. So maybe last one question. Jude says, how does flu and NPS PCR tests can lead to determining COVID-19. We will there be more false positive. PCR recognizes more of flu. So that is a good question, Jude. Uh, ideally, the PCR has to be very, very sensitive. And so there are regulations to say it has to be this much sensitive. And they will have to say that it would not include flu viruses cross reactivity to the test. But I am sure that some of the tests are going to cross react. So we will have an issue. So I think this is what we have for today. <laughs> so Emma Jane, uh, coronavirus is a lie. I usually request those who feel that this is a lie to go and work in those areas where others are um, afraid of the coronavirus's exposure. And I'm just okay. <clears throat> okay, cool. So uh, tell me this what would you like to discuss tomorrow? So, uh, Dr. Mahesh, hypoxia is, I believe, very late stage of cytosine. No. So, oxygen saturation, hypoxia is different. Uh, oxygen saturation is an ind indication of the blood oxygen levels. As soon as they start falling, you have an indicator. And this is very quick. I have seen it. So it is a very reliable way of seeing that somebody may be going towards the cytokine storm. So Debbie Boss says, I keep seeing reports of long haulers who end up around infected persons again, who start up again with the illness full blown. It seems like we are not all protected from reinfection with another hit of virus load. Um, if a person who end up around infected person again, who start up again with the illness. So Debbie, are you talking about the long hauler themselves becoming infected again? Or um, you're talking about somebody who was okay and was exposed to long haulers and becoming infected? Very good, guys. So thank you very much for today. Uh, we'll talk about one of those topics that I've been talking about to do, for example, uh, wormwood or curcumin or our team, our Timisia, <laughs> something. So we can either talk about those or we can talk about this muddy thing with the masks that has started occurring again. But we'll do something tomorrow. And thank you very much. If you are looking to support this work, there is a link in the uh, description of the video, and we will see each other tomorrow. Thank you very much. Please do me a favor. Please like, subscribe, and share. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.